Hey, what's going on? It's your Thursday episode of Locked On Raptors, and on today's show, we have a fun little exercise planned. Louis Zatzman from Raptors Republic is here, and we are going to power rank the various pick-and-roll combinations that are possible within the Raptors' very intriguing and weird starting five. Fred Van Vliet, Pascal Siakam will surely feature heavily. We'll talk about Gary Trent Jr. Should he have an uptick in ball-handling duties as, as he's now currently on the heater of his life? And we'll get into a whole bunch more and just some general thoughts on the way the Raptors Raptors starters are performing with Lewis on today's episode of Locked On Raptors. Thanks for being here. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to episode number 1111, uh, Make a Wish, I guess, of Locked On Raptors. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Sean Woodley, of course. Uh, it is Thursday, February the 3rd. I'm thrown off by the 1111. I've lost my normal cadence for the beginning of the show. Either way, you can find me on Twitter, as always, at Woodley Sean. You can find my work at RaptorsHQ.com, and you can find the podcast free and available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Please go and check out the podcast. You can follow, subscribe, rate, review, and you can subscribe on YouTube once again for the low low price of on the house and as always a big thank you for making us your very first listen of the day all right on today's show fun little exercise plan we're going to power rank some stuff and the stuff we are power ranking are pick and roll combos that are possible within the raptors starting five it's some real basketball nerd stuff baby and so on today's show i am joined by a man who knows very much about basketball and about being just a kind fella it's lewis zatzman from raptors republic lewis what's going on buddy Howdy. Yeah, real basketball nerd stuff. You had to bring in a real <laughs> basketball nerd. Happy to be here. Real excited. Let's power rank. Let's power rank indeed. We will do that in the back two segments of the show. We'll run through our one through five in terms of pick and roll duos. We would like to see the Raptors uh, deploy frequently throughout the rest of the season within their starting five lineup. And the reason I wanted to do this, Lewis, is because the Raptors starting five is so damn fascinating. It's really really an interesting crew it's a new sort of novel concept for team building and lineup construction as we've talked about all season long and i think it's kind of coming to a bit of an inflection point soon here we got word earlier this week that kem birch is likely going to be back within a week and that is going to cause some sort of rotation crunch probably of the good variety because there will be more players to play minutes which is what this team desperately needs but that starting five question is going to pop back up again the starters have been really good. They've been super effective late in games. They've brought their uh, overall net rating up from, you know, I think it was a low point of five point minus 5.9 a couple of games ago. Within a couple of games, they're already almost breaking even at minus 0 0.6. And you would think that that trajectory upward is going to continue as they get more reps together and learn how to play with one another even more. Keep in mind, they've played a grand total of 11 or 12 games together all season long, which is not many games. So with that, before we dive into ranking the different combos that you could run a pick and roll with among the starters on the, on the Raptors, we're going to dig into just a chat about the Raptors starting five. Lewis, where are you at with the small ball experiment? Are you someone who's itching for Ken Birch to get back and demote Scotty Barnes to the bench to have him run second units? Are you okay with keeping the lineup the way it is and then figuring out the big man jumble on the other side with Achua, Boucher, and Birch surely all being deserving of minutes, not to mention Justin Champagny and all the rest? But uh, where are you at right now with the small ball experiment that the Raptors have been rolling out there? Yeah, it's it's both. Uh, it's It answers a simple question by starting mm -hmm. their five, which is how do we get our five best players to play? Well, start them all. Yeah. But by answering that, it raises much more complex questions of its own in that the Raptors have three centers. You mentioned mm -hmm. them all, all of whom are in the rotation. Some nights they're going to have an eight-man rotation, three centers off the bench, the only ones playing off the bench. Like, okay, you're starting your five best players, but in doing so, you're creating a very bizarre and lopsided rotation. Mm -hmm. And so I think gets at a deeper question, which is what you were sort of hinting at, in that the Raptors start five semi-initiators, mm -hmm. right? It's not a center and a, and a couple wings and a couple guards. It is, okay, Fred, probably the only, the team's only point guard, great initiator. Gary, the team's best pull-up shooter. 
And then the three wings, Scotty, Pascal, who are offensive hubs, who sort of initiate in the post and pick and roll. And OG, who is a lot of people's picks for most improved, right? Who, mm-hmm. who needs to run pick and rolls, who get, who's great in the post, who's great ducking. Like these are their five best initiators, all of whom share the court together. So no wonder that they started out a little poor and are getting better because stuff like that takes time. I remember mm-hmm. way back when, when the Miami Heat put together LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh. And they were like, well, there's Clearly only an one inferior ball. collection of players to this Raptors. Team, of course, yeah. <laughs> there's only one ball. Right. And so they, they surrounded those three guys with, with people who just almost never touched the ball. Mario Chalmers, right. Shane mm-hmm. Battier was just awesome mm-hmm. on that team. The Raptors have one up that and said, okay, three initiators. How about five? And yeah. <laughs> we're watching it work in part. We're watching mm-hmm. it fail in part, and we're watching the downsides, which is what we mentioned, the centers. But I'm all in, baby. I mean, mm-hmm. like, why follow everyone when you don't have Steph Curry? If you have Steph Curry or LeBron James or Giannis, you can just follow what other teams are doing, and it'll work. But when you don't mm-hmm. have them, you sort of have to innovate, and we're watching that right now. It's kind of wild how, like, when the Raptors won the championship, they had the most, like, other than maybe the Phoenix Suns of right now, like the most traditional, like this is a basketball lineup ass lineup you've ever seen. It's like they've got the ball dominant small forward. You've got the point guard. You've got the low usage shooting. Like it was just like, yeah, yeah, this is a basketball lineup. I don't know what kind of lineup the Raptors are now with the starting five. It's certainly something resembling basketball, sometimes volleyball, sometimes uh, just like wind sprints. But yeah, they're a, a really, really interesting crew. And you bring up an interesting point about the initiation, right? Like you said, all five of the main initiators on the team are playing together and that's causing you know the the one ball problem that you just discussed and i think scotty barnes is kind of the one that has been probably most affected in terms of his on ball looks like og still getting his chances in pockets of games to go and create for himself gary obviously is playing out of his body right now and you should let him touch the ball i think on literally every possession and i'm fine with it at this point uh and then we know siakam and fred are going to have the ball in their hands a lot because they're the best at it and so scotty is kind of getting I don't want to say diminished because he's still doing a lot of things and he's been so essential on the defensive side of things in that lineup. Like he's still doing really high level role player things, but you're not getting to see those on ball reps that he was getting when they were shorthanded. It seems weird to want to move him to the bench and I've been resistant to it all season long, but the one argument I can hear and say, you know what, maybe that makes some sense is the one for if you move Scotty to the bench, he's just going to get more on ball touches and reps. And that is going to be ultimately a good thing for him long-term. So I could maybe get on board with that argument. Like, I don't think Trent's going to the bench at this point. He's too important to the Raptors. And like, you're not going to start well on offense. If Gary Trent Jr. is not on the floor, basically statistically it's been proven without Gary Trent Jr. On the floor, this team stinks at offense right now. And so I can get on board with Scotty going to the bench in place of Kem if we see Kem maybe come back and have some good run off the bench to begin with. I wouldn't make the switch immediately or anything like that. But where are you at with like how much Scotty should be getting touches? Like, do you think they need to refigure reconfigure how they do things within the starters to get him more looks? Does that take away from obviously more effective and efficient avenues to buckets? Or do you think there is something to the idea of, okay, you start him on the bench for the first six minutes. He's still going to close most games. You're probably going to use that five to close games anyway. Maybe it makes it more difficult rotation-wise to juggle some things, you know, in the back half of games. You don't want to play guys, you know, the final 18 minutes of halves or whatever. But where are you at with the potential of Scotty getting a little bit of a boost by getting moved to the bench? I think this is the right starting lineup. I, I, I don't think Scotty should go to the bench. On one hand, it's hard for Kem to even replace the role player thing Scotty's been doing. Like, I was talking with Samson Folk about this the other day. Mm-hmm. He runs the court better than any big man I've seen. Mm-hmm. And he's been just getting in the paint and sealing early. And that mm-hmm. forces switches, which, as we mentioned, five initiators, switches are good, right? You're getting these guys attacking mismatches. He's got seals and easy put ba- easy baskets. He's just a better finisher than Kemp. And, and look, I love Kemp. I'm one of his mm-hmm. like biggest supporters. I just don't see him doing even those role player things. He's solid. He does more mm-hmm. solid things. But those exceptional role player things that add for what the stars can do, I don't see him doing what, what Scotty gives. But also, right, if he sits for the first five minutes – of the first quarter, let's say five minutes. That's it's probably more, right? You want your starters to mm-hmm. play a lot together. 
then sure. now it's not 48 minutes you're dealing with. Now it's 43, maybe 42. Yeah. And you want him playing 40 minutes. Mm-hmm. So you want him playing 40 of the next 42 minutes? Like that that seems unlikely. That's some and Patrick so, Patterson stuff, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who, man, I I will go down with the ship that Patrick Patterson was an he was phenomenal. Like I love that yeah, guy. Yeah, the plus mine is God, Patrick Patterson. Like and literally there was a as good as Draymond Green if you look at just that one stat. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I think I think Scotty, I agree with you, right? On ball touches, he's getting squeezed. But frankly, and this is something that a lot of fans especially don't want to hear, he was not as efficient with his on-ball touches. Like he sure. was hyper-efficient in putbacks, right? Yep. In, in handoffs, keeper plays where he faked the handoff, turned around, drove to the rim, just went up and stuffed on people. Great in transition. But honestly, when he was running pick and rolls, when he was isolating, when he was just attacking a, a, a static defense out of the post, he was Toronto's like fifth or sixth best initiator so sure. yeah him getting you know initiation touches getting squeezed down from like maybe 10 a game to four a game that's fine and that's probably better for the team mm-hmm. so i have no problem it doesn't hurt his development there like your development happens in very organic as you would like as i'm sure i've heard you talk about it's very nuanced and organic and you do these things ten thousand times in practice for every mm-hmm. 10 times you do it on the court and so, sure. you know, losing six initiation touches a game doesn't matter for your development. So I'm not concerned. I think it's better for the team. Uh, I think he should stay in the starting lineup. And there's also something to the idea that he's probably their best collector of garbage buckets, which for a yeah. team that has basically oriented itself around, we're going to get a lot of garbage buckets because like we have to, because we can't, you know, run a typical offense and have a really elite offensive rating with it because of just the pieces we have on hand, having him off ball, able to go crash the glass, not the worst thing in the world. Um, And he's going to get those. That's how he kind of happens into 16 points on these nights, right? Is he just kind of around and he gets those dump offs and whatnot. And so, yeah, I'm still fully on board with the small lineup. And I also think that there's probably going to be some sort of shakeup of some kind to the rotation before the deadline next week, whether that's Boucher on his way out, whether that's, you know, a bigger trade involving potentially precious uh, or something like that. Maybe it's maybe there's not a deal and there's just going to have three centers for the rest of time and maybe just one or two don't get in the rotation as a wing comes in or something like that. Either way, I, I'm still very in on the small ball look to start. And it's like, again, it's not even small. It's enormous. <laughs> it's yeah. just like, it's, it, it's, you know, as Mike Prada once pointed out, the, the greatest trick the Raptors have pulled is convincing other teams they're small because they ain't. Um, we're going to continue on here, man, and dive into the really sort of joy of having five creators on the floor at a time and power rank our favorite pick and roll combos that the Raptors can conjure. We'll do that in just one second. But first, want to tell you about our friends over at Bet Online that has you covered with this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football continues its march to the playoffs right towards the big game. In a couple of weeks, BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just football. Bet Online has up-to-the-minute info on pro and college hoops and of NHL boxing UFC along with live real time updates of current games there's also like international soccer if you want to do that you can go there's like turkish basketball games you can get details on either way don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing and new offers available for the 2022 season bet online is where the game starts all right we continue forward on your first listen of the day diving into our power rankings now of the pick and roll combos uh possible within the raptors starting five this is the fun thing i've been really enjoying lewis i think honestly it's been a bit of a key to their success in crunch time they've been one of the better crunch time teams in the league this year and in the absence of like a clear and obvious closer they just have five guys who can go do something which is pretty damn cool and so Let's dig into this here. We'll start with our very top and work our way down to five as I think the conversations will become a little bit more interesting as we get into the deeper ranks, parts of this ranking. But let's begin with our first, our our ideal pick and roll combos within the Raptors starting five. Lewis, I will let you go first. Okay, so I cheated. I put two in the top. It's the same two guys. (laughs) Yeah, I put six in my top five, you know, classic. Uh, I had Fred's screening for pascal pascal screening for fred is sort of 1a 1b Mm -hmm. Uh, interestingly statistically pascal screening for fred is toronto's best uh and highest efficiency look which isn't that surprising Mm -hmm. 
I mean, mm-hmm. Pascal is Toronto's best screener um, this season, at least. He's super efficient catching the ball, putting it back in. Maybe the best passer on the move there because he's so gigantic. And mm-hmm. Fred is Toronto's best handler, without a doubt. Great pull-up shooter, you know, just a, a demon passing out of the pick and roll. Uh, and so, yeah, and, and that also puts Gary and OG off ball, who are two of Toronto's best catch and shoot shooters, just really good, uh, setup. Uh, the other way, you know, Fred screening for Pascal, it's not something you're going to throw out 20 times a game, like the, like the inverse, but what you will get, there's some really nice switches, right? That'll get yeah. Pascal attacking littles or Fred shooting really open shots. You're going to get one of those two options, no matter what. It's something you might save all game and throw in three straight times in in clutch time. Uh, But yeah. those two are just like, you're going to get a good shot every time, no matter what. So I think in the spirit of the game, you are correct with your pick in this one. Like, I think both, whatever iteration is probably the the correct answer here i went more specific with i just think fred screening for siakam as much as you said it's more of a thing you bust out when you're sort of desperate and you need to uh i love it and i think it's probably me hanging on to the last vestiges of the 2019-20 season where lowry screening for siakam was basically an instant bucket whenever they wanted it and i think we've seen in a couple instances here too the reason i like siakam on the ball in the situation is i think it's probably a little bit more playoff proof than fred having siakam screen for him because fred we've seen as much as he's been incredible this season and the leaps he's made he hasn't grown six inches and that's just not going to happen and so the double teams the extra attention the hedges that that are going to come his way in the postseason i think are you know it's proven i think that it's going to give him a little bit more trouble we've seen it against teams already this season and you know length is always going to be a thing that bothers him but if you have Siakam on the ball and he is on a heater and he's got the mid-range pull-up working, there's not a whole lot you can do to guard him in that situation. And if you are going to you know, say, all right, we're going to send two to Siakam because we can't handle this dude turning the corner and going downhill, boom, you got pick and pop threes for Fred all day. And you know, we, we've seen that bear out in a couple of games this season. So I think as far as like playoff proof, and again, you're hunting matchups in the postseason a lot. I think that's kind of why I would opt for Fred screening for Siakam, even if Siakam screening for Fred, for Fred is the more commonly used play and the more efficient play. I think as far as postseason goes, I like the idea of it, it on the inverse. But again, you can't really go wrong with either of these. This is sort of the chalk pick. So we'll move on to the next one in our rankings. Uh, number two, I'll go first with this one. I have uh, Pascal Siakam screening for Scotty Barnes. And you also have Pascal Siakam screening for Scotty Barnes. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, this one I think speaks for itself. You get two guys who will be kind of switch proof. You get two guys who obviously can handle, who can see over the defense. Both can operate in the short roll really effectively. So you could do this either way, I'm sure. But Siakam with the ball in his hands, obviously so dynamic. I think you kind of have a ready-made offensive board crasher if Scotty's rolling and you get Siakam. You kind of get those two guys both barreling towards the rim. That's a lot for a defense to process. Do we send two guys over to, to wall off Siakam? Does it open up the dump off pass to Scotty, et cetera, et cetera? You know, Pascal puts up a mid range pull up. Scotty's there to collect the offensive board. I, I just love the dynamism there. And you get your three knockdown shooters rotating around these two six nine weirdos. Uh, I think that is a pretty fun configuration. Why did you have it number two? Yeah, the main reason was what you closed off with there. You have your three best shooters off the ball. And so you've mm-hmm. tons of space for these guys. I actually, I think you described it with Pascal with the ball in his hands and Scotty screening. I actually, my preference would be the inverse. Scotty with okay. the ball in his hands. And, and the main reason for that, and I think the the You're right, I did do that because I'm a fool and can't read. Let's carry on. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the key thing is, um, they're going to, like, any defense worth its salt is going to switch. And yeah. so what you want when they switch is the better player Pascal to have the easier, the easier matchup. And so when Scotty is the ball in his hands, they switch Pascal just rolls into the post with whoever was guarding Scotty dunk, dump it in the, the whole point of this play is you either get the kick out for an open three, one of your, the three best shooters on your team, or you've Pascal in the post against uh, the, the opponents probably second or third best wing post defender so that's the that's like it's not something you're going to get you know those complex actions for 
It's purely to force that switch and get Pascal Eaton. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think, you know, you can go with it either way, but really it, there is no wrong way to approach those two guys involved in actions together. And this is a way to get Scotty more on ball reps too, right? Like, it, you know, if you're trying to find the perfect ecosystem for him to get those on ball reps, if there are going to be a limited number of them within the context of the offense, this is probably the best way to set him up for success in those situations. If you do throw the ball to him, have Siakam screen and have space literally everywhere. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so good one there. Uh, we have one more we'll get to here before we move into the break. Uh, my third one, I have uh, a sort of re-up of the first one. I have Siakam screening for Fred. Again, probably objectively wrong to have it third, but you know you got to have an entertaining podcast to put together here. So deal with me as I do that. Uh, you have another one, and it is Scotty screening for Fred. I'll let you go off on this one because I've already talked about Siakam screening for Fred. We've already talked about that. So Scotty screening for Fred. Why do you like that so much? Yeah, one thing I love about Scotty is he probably creates the best passing windows on the team. Sure. Uh, and this is, I mean, Cam is also fantastic. It would be one of the two. But Scotty is gigantic. Like mm -hmm. when he extends his arms, he's like Joel Embiid sized. It is insane when you see him. And he is so good at finding that little angle to create that bounce pass for him. And so mm -hmm. he, he doesn't rush, right? He doesn't sprint to the rim like like uh, Precious or Chris might, which, which has its values. But Scotty has this great rhythm. And so what I love for this setup is when Scotty screens for Fred, you're going to have Fred have the most passing options of anything. And yeah. he is one of the best passing guards in the league this year, right? He's been up there for assists um, for the past two or three years. This year, I think, is by far his best passing season. And this gives mm -hmm. him his most passing options. Yeah. Scotty's a great finisher. If, if he gets the ball anywhere within six feet, it's basically game over. Great offensive rebounder if Fred goes for the pull-up. And so this is probably the option where... You know, you're not really looking to swing it elsewhere on the floor. What you're looking is for one of these two guys to score. Because if you switch, like you just, this is a switch proof setup because Scotty's yeah. going to dust a guard just like with absolute ease. And so uh, this is a, a real scoring dynamic option. Yeah. And especially if like Scotty is sort of the nominal center, you would think that if they are going to switch, which again, terrible idea if you're putting a small onto Scotty, yeah. but if they do, then you might have a big out there who Fred can cook as well. Right. And so there's a lot of in interesting things to that. Sorry, go ahead. Which won the game for Toronto yeah. against uh, Atlanta. Is, Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Fred and Pascal were playing their little pick and roll dance. They switched a big on Fred, and he was like, "All right, drove, uh, drew help, kicked out to OG for the three. So if you switch a big on Fred, I think he's proven like he's gonna get a good shot out of that. Mm -hmm. And I also think like in the context of like playoff proof setups, this one also kind of qualifies. You know, yes, yeah. you might see Fred get a lot of attention, but. Scotty is a horrifying presence on the on the short roll. Like he's such a good yeah. passer. If you give him space at the nail, I mean, you've got Gary and OG all around, and you've got Siakam probably cutting baseline at some point, and he demands so much attention as well. I mean, that is a pretty terrifying setup. If I'm an opposing defense, thinking about Scotty Barnes picking my shit apart in a four on three, like no, thank you. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah, I, I like this one quite a bit as well. Even if, yeah, I still remain a little bit concerned about you know inviting traps to Fred in the postseason. But again, these are problems for the future Raptors, and he's shown just. It's not like he's uh, you know 2015 Demar passing out of traps either. He's pretty damn good at it, even at his diminutive size. You know, if you send super duper length at him, it might be a problem, but he's been pretty good at navigating it and hasn't, you know, thrown himself into like nine turnover games or anything like that when he has seen that attention. So uh, good one there. We have two more combos each to rank and discuss. We will get to that in just one second on the other side. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at rockauto.com who are making your life a whole lot easier and giving you the power back when you go to the auto shop or the dealership or whatever it might be. The dealership, the car parts store is a horrifying place. I know nothing about cars. I'm a fool. And I think they know it. They can smell it on me when I walk into a mechanic and they're like, oh, this guy, we're going to fleece this dude for the parts he needs. 
No longer is that the case because when I need a part for my car, instead of going to the dealership and saying, hey, can I buy this part from you? And they say, yes, this is the only one we have. It costs $10,000 or something thereabouts. I instead am picking up my parts at rockauto.com and bringing them in and saying, hello, sir, put this into my car. And it's a wonderful feeling because they can't charge you for the insanely expensive part. And you have re-established control over the mechanic. That sounds weird, but you know what I mean. Go to rockauto.com right now. Check out all of their amazing parts. They got everything you need from the important stuff like brake parts to the aesthetic stuff like new carpets and everything in between. I've one time purchased a gas cap for like $4 off of rockauto.com. They are a wonderful family-owned business. They've been doing it for 20 years and the prices are the same for every customer, whether you're a pro or a do-it-yourselfer or something even less than that, like me, where I take it to somebody else I know. Like, oh, hey, father-in-law, can you do this thing on the car? Please do that. Rock Auto it helps make that all very easy. So go to rockauto.com right now. See the, all the parts available for your car or truck. Right, locked on there. How did you hear about us, Box? So that we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the car parts you will ever need at rockauto.com. Rounding out your first listen of the day here with Louis Zatzman of Raptors Republic, ranking the pick and roll combos for your Toronto Raptors starting lineup. And we go to number four, each of our rankings. We've already talked about my number four, which is Scotty screen for Fred Van Vliet. So once again, I'll see the floor to you, Louis. Who is your number four? Which, what is your, which is your, I don't know which W word to use here. I'm bad at grammar. Uh, which uh, pick and roll combo is your fourth on this power ranking exercise? Okay. So, so here I went a little off the board. I think this might invite the most disagreement. I thought Pascal screening for Gary. Uh, Ooh, now this I like is it. something I like it. You, <laughs> this is something again you, you're not going to want a lot because I think teams will figure this option out more than the others. Mm -hmm. But what you have in Gary Trent is Toronto's best pull-up shooter, and that mm -hmm. might be surprising. Surprising, Fred is like one of the premier pull-up shooters in the league, attempting over five threes a game, but he's never really shot uh, too much above league average. Uh, mm -hmm. Gary, on the other hand, shooting like 36% on pull-up threes, mm -hmm. which is in like just the tier below Steph Dame level, like a really, really functional accuracy rate. And so anything like you ice, you switch, you drop, whatever you want to do, a pull-up three from Gary is, is great. That is an elite, mm -hmm. elite option. On the other hand, if you if you uh, try to take that away, Pascal, as we already mentioned, is Toronto's best scoring option as a screener. And so, you know, this is something that's going to get, it's like a fastball option, right? You're mm -hmm. going to punch it past the other team's defense. The reason right. why I don't think it is a many-time-a-game look, the reason why I think it might be controversial is because if you blitz Gary, he hasn't shown the ability to pass out of it and create an advantage. You might turn mm -hmm. it over at the very best. You might just reset and you'll figure out what yeah. you do then. So it, it can be defanged. What do you think though about Gary handling? Do you think it's, I, I mean, you didn't put Gary as a handler in your list. I did not. I seriously considered it. Uh, and then when I saw that you did it, I figured, Hey, we're going to get to talk about it anyway. So I'm not going to do it, but like he would have been probably in like my sixth uh, one on these rankings. Um, had I cheated like you, it would have been on the list. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think, with Gary, I'm happy to see him try it. Like, why not? He's 23 years old. Like, give him some reps. See what he can do in a couple possessions a game. They did that in the last game a little bit. I think late in the game, if I'm not mistaken, they ran a couple pick and rolls with him. And, yeah, I, I think the playmaking is always going to be the limiting factor there. Also, the fact that, like, Siakam is maybe not someone you want picking and popping, although he's been better from three this season. Like, I feel like you're kind of limited in the total sort of range of options you have out of that set. But... I do think it's worth seeing what Gary can do because he's shown a propensity for figuring out counters, right? Like he's got yeah. the step back he's figured out. He's figured out that mid-range game. He's gotten pretty good at putting guys on his hip when he gets into the mid-range and sort of slowly meandering to the basket. Like we'll see if this like recent uptick in free throw rate is going to sustain. I would imagine it's probably not. And it's probably a reason why I wouldn't have him as like a primary ball handler just because he's just not going to have the same level of dynamism that a typical ball handler will. He's not going to get downhill. He's not really going to turn the corner and just blast his way to the rim. But with that pull-up shooting being such a threat, 
why not bust it out a couple times a game? And if you can get him some extra reps, you know, three, four times a game where he is making those pretty simple reads, you know, pocket passes in the pick and roll, finding guys through traps, etc. Why not see what he could do? Like we're still as much as we're talking about this team now as, hey, maybe they can make a push for the sixth seed or better or, um, you know, what kind of win now buying moves are they going to make at the deadline? This is still a, you know, look at me, wait and see type season. And you're trying to get as much information as you can. So I don't think there's too much downside to, you know, sectoring off, you know, a few possessions a game to have Gary run pick and roll. And Pascal is as good a pairing for him in that as any, I would say. So I don't think this is a crazy pick at all. And the other thing he's he did, it hasn't so much been with the starters. When he's run offense with the bench a little bit, he's thrown mm-hmm. some nice lobs out of the pick yeah. and roll. Like there was yeah. a stretch where he was playing backup point guard when Scotty was uh was injured. Mm-hmm. And he threw some lobs to Precious, I think, that were really on the money. And I was I was impressed with. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's 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 could be a very high highfalutin or high caliber you know look uh Mm -hmm. like you say uh no harm yeah yeah i um yeah gary trent jr rocks give him the ball i guess every possession and you're fine uh let's carry on to the final one and on this uh we we each have a different uh combo for our number five in the power rankings but they both involve the same screener so i'll bring up the little graphic and we can discuss number five i have og screening for siakam and you have og screening for Fred Van Vliet. It's the first time OG's appeared here. He has not appeared as a ball handler. Maybe not terribly surprising considering the mixed returns when he's had the ball in his hands this season. And he feels more like a post-up ISO type guy when you're going to run your possessions with him. But as a screener, he's thick as hell. He is a pretty good screener. He's a decent yeah. short roll playmaker. And he can also pop as well. So you have a couple of different options there. Um, why do you like the OG-Fred combination? Yeah, I mean, you described OG as a screener really well. You you hit all the high points that I like about him. Uh, when you're looking for one of those three forwards, Pascal, Scotty, OG, he's the best shooter, right? So he mm-hmm. is the best one that you're going to get popping. The reason why I chose Fred as the handler rather than uh, Siakam uh, is because I don't want it to be too easily switchable. OG sure, and Siakam are, are more or less the same size. Uh, and, and with Fred, if you switch that, you just you have so many weaknesses that Fred and OG have proven. Like OG in the post against a guard, that's been fantastic this season. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's that's purely the only reason why I chose it. Hey, I think that's a good call, man. I, you know the the Siakam and OG, it's kind of like for like. I like it because you get you know you get both Fred and Gary off ball which i think you know that's not a bad thing by any means i think yeah. anytime you can get Fred off ball honestly and, and have Siakam with the ball in his hands i'm pretty happy just cuz you know i don't that's not to say i don't want Fred to run pick and roll cuz boy he's really really effective at it and he's gotten so so good but i think like most of the time better things happen in offensive possessions when Siakam has it and i just like the sort of it's sort of bruising. It's sort of what clunky and weird. And yes, it can be easily switched because they're the same size essentially, but I, I still like the options you can get out of the Siakam OG situation. But yeah, I mean, your, your switching point makes a lot of sense. And I think for OG and red, like that's a totally reasonable number five, probably the more correct one. Honestly, I just wanted to make sure OG got in there and we got a shout because uh, you know, he, he's uh, as much as we've kind of used him only as an off ball guy in all this conversation, there's a lot to be said for him kind of being mixed up in the action as well. One thing that might be really nice for OG and, and Pascal together is run them as, as horn screeners where they're both standing on the elbows and mm-hmm. then enter the ball like in the post to Pascal, and then OG ambles over. So instead sure. of the pick and roll being behind the arc, it's right at the free throw line. So if you do switch, it's just one dribble at the rim. Um, mm-hmm. So there's definitely ways to make it work. And one thing I think I'd like to say about OG, what you described in Fred both, I was I was thinking this in 2019-20, you know, several worlds ago. <laughs> OG was so good off the ball. He was one of Toronto's mm-hmm. best floor spacers. And he was also one of Toronto's best screeners. And I Mm -hmm. remember asking Nick, I was like, OG is so good in the middle of the floor, so good outside the arc, and also needs development with the ball in his hands. It's like, how do you deal with a guy who's like best over here and best over there? And I Mm -hmm. think Fred has sort of entered that as well. When you Mm -hmm. described, you know, he's pretty good at the pick and roll, but also you want him off the ball because he's like the best catch and shoot shooter in the league. They're both those types of players where you kind of want them everywhere 
And what a treat to have multiple guys like that where they're just like so effective no matter where you want to put them. There's like an opportunity cost for not having them elsewhere. It's just wonderful. Oh, no, my arms are overflowing with players with diverse strengths. (laughs) What are we going to do? And I mean, this whole conversation, as we come close to wrapping it up here, we should know, like, it's not like the Raptors run a ton of pick and roll. So this exercise is speaking about like, I don't know, 18% of their possessions. But I guess the question is like, should they run it more with these guys that they have on board? You know, we've talked all along about how, you know, they don't really run a traditional offense and, you know, they haven't had like incredible half court results doing things the way they have, where they run a bazillion handoffs and whatnot. Like, is there something to be said with this lineup in particular with, you know, the pretty decent shooting you have, at least three knockdown guys and a couple of guys who I don't think defenses necessarily care all that much about, especially Scotty, but, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not afraid to take them. So there's that. Is, is there an argument to be made for this team scaling up its pick and roll usage as it goes forward here now that they've kind of established the starting five where everyone can kind of put the ball in the deck and do something with it? Yeah, it's funny. I was... um just doing a bunch of research because I was pitching a piece about how every team's offense changes in the clutch. Mm -hmm. And the Raptors, there's sort of three categories. Teams, Everyone runs more isolation, like 28 teams of them. So when I say run more isolation, I mean like double the amount of isolation. So that's one category. Teams run way more isolation because everyone runs a little more. Teams run more pick and rolls in teams Mm -hmm. that more or less stay the same. And the Raptors, a lot of people might think because they're so, people think it's like my turn, your turn in the clutch. People would think they run way more ISO. It's not true. They actually Mm -hmm. fall firmly in the more pick and roll side of things. Mm -hmm. And so when you said, should they run more pick and roll? I think it's actually very acknowledged by Nick and by Fred and the other decision makers. Like, yeah, maybe this is how we're at our best. Right. So they they may want, because every possession you run you choose some play by definition you're not choosing other plays and the raptors have so many guys who are happy in the post happy in isolation that when you run a lot of pick and rolls you're kind of taking away the bread and butter from pascal from scotty from fred and and so i understand not being a high pick and roll team during games but man Mm -hmm. they love it at the end of games and there's a reason why because they're super efficient at it when they need to be yeah, 100%. 112.3 offensive rating in the clutch. Uh, <laughs> you know, the Suns are at 135.5. I can't get over the Suns' clutch numbers. They're ridiculous. But, and they change know, nothing. They, they, like, yeah. They're exactly the same in the clutch as they are every, everywhere else. Let me tell you, with our friends at Bet Online, I put a little money on the Suns to win the title when they were like 20 to 1 earlier on this season. Or maybe it wasn't 20 Smart. to 1. It might have been 10 to 1. But uh, I'm feeling pretty good about winning some bucks. I'll tell you that. The Suns. <laughs> rock uh that feels like a good place to leave this off an unexpected place but a good place nonetheless <laughs> lewis thank you so much man this was a lot of fun just chopping it up about hoop you gotta love it uh where can people check out all your wonderful work yeah it's so i uh took a little break just easing my way back in now so not too much out there right now but uh raptors republic you can always find my my recaps my opens tons and tons of features and whatever so Check me out there. And yeah, thank you so much for having me, man. Always a blast. Anytime, brother. Anytime I can get someone on who's smarter than me, I always take it to the advantage. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Anyway, thank you so much for tuning in to the show. Everybody, you can subscribe to, follow, rate, review, etc. wherever you get your podcast for the low, low price of On The House. It's also on YouTube. You can go subscribe there. Hit that big red subscribe button. We are closing in on 1,600 subs, which is incredible and would love to continue to shoot those numbers through the moon. So please go ahead and support over there. And with that, we will leave you off with your first listen of the day now complete go make your second listen of the day locked on bets as your boy q and lee sterling of paramount sports are walking you through everything leading up to the super bowl you've got all the props all the game lines and everything like that they are going to tell you where to win your money on super bowl sunday so go and check that out sorry i'm supposed to call it the big game for reasons uh we will uh, round it up there we'll be back again tomorrow to talk raptors bulls i think katie heinel is going to stop by for that one enjoy the game tonight and we will talk to you again friday with another episode of locked on raptors Bye bye <laughs>